Tamir. I think it's um, it's a good time to bring up the conversation, right? Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to go, but I'd love to say something about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think this whole COVID thing has had a very interesting impact in Western cultures, um, because people have been enforced um forced to embrace edtech and virtual learning much sooner than they would have liked. Um, like you said, it's been a thing in Asia for 10 years already. Um, but there was this perception here of online is not as good. Um, and we've kind of made people try it. And in cases where it's done right, people have gone, wow, this is actually better in many cases. Um, and yeah, on your, on your piece of paper comment, um, one of my favorite things I've seen was a bunch of Ivy League schools at the start of um, lockdown put all of their coursework online for free. Yeah. Um, all their lecture videos, everything. And essentially their mentality was, you know what? Anyone can go and they can get the skills. And then it's just about what really is the value in this piece of paper. So if you want the piece of paper, come and pay your $300,000 a year for your Harvard degree. Or if you just want to know how to do what the course is teaching you to do from the best teacher in the world, come watch our videos, they're free. Um, which I think is such an interesting switch of priorities, right? Because education really is a business in many cases. Um, and that's why public education ends up being so poor. Um, but it's not asking you to me because you're clearly a serial entrepreneur and I'm wondering what your angle is on, on solving that problem. Um, I'm sure you've been thinking about it. <laughs> um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with, with all of that. And like universities are in big trouble um, across the world because they're, people are realizing Hey, why are we paying so much if we're being taught online? Why, well, and especially in America, where people are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars and then in debt um, for the rest of their lives. Like, why are they doing this? And because of how expensive it is to run a university, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing big university names being like, we might need to close doors or needing to make some incredibly disruptive moves to, to kind of change. In regards to, um, like the ways in which this moves and and like the kind of platforms or businesses that can be created from this opportunity i think there are a lot of incredible players that are starting to to already kind of emerge the the world leader in regards to like the most valuable ed tech company at the moment is a company in india called baiju's um and they just they're a company funny enough for primary and secondary school that just walks kind of does tutoring as well as like a learning management platform that a student will go, go to maths and science and whatever it might be. So those kinds of platforms are going to become more and more prevalent. And I certainly imagine a future where your whole primary and secondary school career is done through a single app um, that guides you through the curriculum. But more so around the, the idea of employment and jobs, it's like you don't need a university degree and you don't need university courses in order to become a coder, to become a graphic designer, to become a video editor, um, to become a marketer. Um, it's all nonsense. Um, it helps, right? Like when an employer is looking at a thousand candidates and you have a Yale name, like, okay, cool, this guy might know what they're doing, but ultimately it doesn't say much to that the quality of work that they're going to do. And you have a couple interesting business models. One standard in particular, a company called Lambda School in America, where they pay you to go study with them to learn coding. And then what they do is they take a, a fraction of your income for the next like five years, right? And like, that's how confident they are. They're like, we will pay you to come study with us or, and, and we know we're gonna get you a job such that we'll make enough money from your salary and taking a percentage of that that will make up for the educational investment. So I can see a lot more platforms emerging like that. That's a really interesting model. I haven't heard of that one, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm really blown away. I think you said something that I think is going to become huge. And I, I think that's just the kind of person you are. Every word that comes out of your mouth, I like can too, because I know it's going to turn to gold in some weird way. Um, so yeah, I'm just very inspired by you. And this has really got me thinking because the whole COVID situation and moving online has helped my studies tremendously. And I've genuinely committed to myself to staying this way um, and staying to sticking at home, working through problems myself, using YouTube. Um, and I think that's a lot of my friends are going to be doing the same. So I think this is already shifting, even if universities aren't going to shift, I think their student body has already. So they need to catch up or catch a wake up. 
Um, and I think the second question um, I have is, if our university and education system is going to change, how does our recruiting need to change at the same time? Um, because if our recruiters are still looking for a piece of paper from, let's say, Yale, but we've got someone here who maybe not, like, might have not had the resources to go to Yale, but spent all the hours doing all those Yale courses and whatever, doesn't have the piece of paper, like, how can recruiters, you know, how can that facilitate this movement? You guys keep mentioning Yale, that's what my sister's studying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually started varsity last two weeks ago. Um, but I think what, like what my parents are sort of saying is like, what we're buying is a brand. Um, we're buying that, yeah. you know, my child's a Yale graduate. I think the problem is we like UCT is a brand. It's a signal to employers of the quality of work that you can do. And I think for the, for the recruiter question, the problem is that until that branding does, is not valuable anymore and isn't a signal, um, and I think what will happen, it'll have to be sort of a change over time. So the more people that are sort of doing these other courses or these other methods and are shown to be as worthy candidates, that's where that shift is. But I think also like, the problem is like the way almost the feeding system works. So it's like recruiters come to UCT. They want UCT students. Um, you also have to change the way we funnel people into these um, into the into the corporate world essentially um as well as changing the perception of having a university degree yeah, yeah. i think um i think in in many ways the um the issue of like the prestige of schools gets solved in tamir's like modern digital education utopia because if everyone's learning from the same centralized platform of content and it doesn't matter which place you're getting your tickets of the content from right because it's just one pile of it of resources um and, and I think removing that exclusivity barrier is huge. Um, one of the most interesting studies I've read, um, I think it was actually mentioned in Malcolm's lab, anyways, um, was if you go to an Ivy League, unless you're in the top 5% in your grade at, in your year at the Ivy League college, you're actually better off going to a, no, like a non-Ivy League mm. school because of the damage to your confidence um, going from always being like the smartest person you know to absolutely feeling like crushed and stupid in comparison to your classmates. Um, and, and on that, I think it's really interesting in online how you're much more required to match up against yourself. Like you're not sitting in class with other people and they're all getting it really quickly. Like you can go at your own pace. That's the biggest advantage. Yeah. Yeah, and I think like um, Elon Musk's already started or, or he's like brand is kind of like, you don't need to have a degree. All you need is to be able to pass my tests and then you can get the job, right? So I think it, that, that change does almost like employees, employers can already start taking that upon themselves and say like, um, here's a bunch of um, like jobs available. Here's a, a test. Doesn't matter how you pass the test. Um, you should just, you know, do that, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And I think um, comes what you said about like you buying a network of people, right? And I think that's why a lot of people go to business school or do their MBAs, not because they really want to learn about business, right? Um, because they want to build that network and why a lot of people postponed their MBAs be during COVID. It just showed where the value of that MBA program is. Like, it's not the content, it's that people wanted to have that, almost that life experience, um, but still make themselves feel good that they were still in some sort of formal um, program and then also be able to to build their network. Yeah. And I think I think also in South Africa, the way sort of corporate works it's a, it's a network of people. So the easier it is, you know, oh, we all went to the same high school, we went to the same university. Oh, I know someone at so-and-so. That's kind of how business works. Yeah. So I think yeah. when access, I think as Josh said, more people are able to access things, um, it will be better. So I just have two comments. The first was on, uh, I think what Carmen was talking about, how she prefers like studying in this environment. And I was wondering, how do you guys think when we go back to Varsity, um, Live Jive, do you think people will attend less, attend more? How do you think it will affect mm. um, learning? I mean, if I can say, well, I can just watch all your old lecture videos and get a pretty good mark, um, why am I really wasting my time when I can, I think freedom of time, people value that. Um, and I think the second thing also is like, as much as we have all of this sort of online ability, 
you're really going to get left behind. So I think in South Africa, when we talk about access to internet, access to infrastructure, the cost yep. of data, it's like, it's all very well and good that the information's online, but the fact that people even now with getting laptops from UCT are struggling to study online. So will it not just make the gap between people who have things and people who don't have things um, even bigger? Something that like I'm quite passionate about, but like education and access to education and thinking about that. And I think in the beginning of COVID, I, I saw almost like this move as being quite, almost, like it is very terrible for people that already don't have access to these things. Um, but almost seeing that that could maybe be a short, short term like barrier to entry or problem that once we get that um, that infrastructure, that that certain level of, of capital to these people, we open so many doors. Like the investment, the the return of that investment is almost exponential. Um, like I know I I um, sent a laptop because a, a girl that in uh, one of the daughters of the the cleaners at where I work, her daughter doesn't have um, access to to any internet, right? So what I did, I, I sent a laptop with a bunch of past papers and videos and pre-downloaded videos to her. And she said the knowledge she's able to get from that way surpasses the knowledge she gets, she has gotten from just the, the, the school she goes to, right? Which is quite a, a low, re a really low resource school in both like like the the, the people the, the teachers and and the resources right so first i was like oh my god technology terrible and now i'm almost like um it's if we can get over that initial speed bump i feel like we're just opening doors for so many people and it's something that we wouldn't necessarily have to rely on the government for um because people can use this as a business opportunity like almost low low priced access to all of these things to people and yeah quite exciting i think um i think there's there's two interesting places where tech can really come in there um first of all and this requires some sort of large player buy-in is zero rated resource websites like this should be a thing 100 percent in south africa um even in even in um I'm, I'm not sure exactly about south africa but i know certainly in the case of nigeria it's like an average of two and a half cell phones per human in nigeria like mm -hmm. there's no shortage of cell phones there's a shortage of like data because data is really expensive here um there's a shortage of available resources so just a centralized zero rated thing that all networks agree to zero rate would be amazing and um, secondly is i know you're saying it doesn't have to be um government instituted but the relative cost if we had like you were saying like centralized reported resources the relative cost to put like um, a, a Raspberry Pi and a really crappy projector into every into a bunch of classrooms, and then having instead of um, instead of like a, a teacher teaching the content, the content being taught really well by this centralized thing, and having teachers trained to instead answer questions and to work students through problems like tutors would, I think is a way more efficient and cheaper way of solving the problem um, mm -hmm. than trying to give like every student getting a laptop is not feasible in a South African context, right? Um, but I think that kind of idea, especially when a Raspberry Pi now costs like what, 400 Rand per year, something like that. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, a Raspberry Pi and a 400 Rand projector is like, okay, 800 Rand a classroom still sounds like a lot, but it's, it's, it's a step better. Um, like it's I mean, step relative to what a classroom would cost today, it's, it's, it's probably a, yeah. a, a fraction. Um, yeah, 100% see like a future of community kind of schools and colleges where it's like computer centers built into communities where people are going to learn and study. And instead of there being a teacher professor, you have a variety of different tutors and people are just upskilling to become these tutors, which are then guiding and helping people get through the content. Because like the, a big challenge, and I'd love to ask this question is, I think for us being a little bit older, um, more mature, it's easy for us to self-drive for education. We have, we, we, we just, we know what we're doing to an extent, right? Hopefully. Um, but for, for younger ages, maybe um, seven, eight, et cetera, there it's a little bit more challenging to incentivize them to, to self-drive their own education. And I'd love to hear how you think, what, what sort of solution, do you think that's valid? And like, what sort of solution could, could you see there? So here's, here's actually where tech has a bit of a shortfall. Um, so from a, I might have mentioned this before in one of the other courses, from a project in Australia, um, students under grade five literally cannot focus for more than half an hour yeah. at a time on a screen. 
It's just not possible. Like it doesn't matter how interactive you're being, how well they know the person on the other side of the screen, whether there's like bells and whistles and noises and brightly colored buttons on the screen, they just lose focus. Um, yeah. Because there isn't any physical interaction like there is in the case of a classroom. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we need to overcome um, in terms mm -hmm. of applying tech to education is in that younger bracket where they just aren't able to like engage with digital content in the same way. Like everyone was saying, like, as much as this is so awesome and so needed in the South African context, like how many other barriers do we need to jump over first? You know, like data, connection, um, home environment. Um, I think, you know, none of this is going to work if yeah. our home environments don't become spaces of learning too. Um, you know, at, like, you the, the single biggest roadblock in academic development, in, um, especially in poorer communities, is the inability of parents to teach the kids the basic academic skills that wealthier families will teach. So reading, um, not only access to books, but actually parents that know how to teach a kid to read and to count um, is a massive developmental inhibitor, mm -hmm. um, especially in this country. So there's lots of literacy programs trying to teach not only kids, but teaching parents how to do this. Um, because the age at which you learn or the age at which you should be taught reading and counting makes a very big difference in your academic development. And, and to, so around reading and at, at those young ages, but it's also the, the language that the content is in, because it's all in English, right? Um, so all of these like great math videos I was pointing to, it's all in English, not in, not in um, the native language of a, of a kid. And it, these challenges are already like tough um to to learn and then if you're learning them in another um language it's virtually impossible so there is a, also going to be a need for a lot of south african content creators south african math youtubers and science youtubers teaching in zulu cluster other other african languages um and that i think is another big opportunity around either entrepreneurship or for government to kind of step into and also like everyone in this call like it just got our juices flowing and thinking about all these cool different ideas um but yeah just to touch on what you said about the younger generation i think that is also yeah quite an important factor to consider is also how our attention span is being affected by everything being digitized like it's it's not necessarily just the kids i mean just as a species <laughs> we are evolving now to be able to pay less attention in one sitting to things um, which I guess is part of the, I don't know. Yeah, it's just part of the, the, the process. Um, but yeah, also evident, like I have a, a younger cousin who is like, I don't know, six or seven years old. And I can see that when he has hold of like a tab, he just wants to play. Like there's no, there's no part of him that's like, oh, I can watch a, an informational YouTube video on this yeah. thing. It's just games, games. So I was also yeah, going to add to what Carmen said earlier on is that I don't know, maybe some kind of gamifying um, would probably help, you know, the, the learning process. And th the question that I actually wanted to ask was, how is this going to affect us socially? If, if let's just say the learning centers aren't um, happening, like we're not all getting together in a classroom and watching the projector together, if we're now all staying at home and learning from yeah. home, which is already like lockdown has already made this, like you can't meet people. But now what if people start voluntarily not wanting to go out because they can just do everything at home? You know, how's that going to change our dynamic? I think, I think this, yeah, this falls into as well what we were talking about previously, that part of the degree and an MBA is the network that you're establishing, right? And the, the social environment. And that's certainly a big challenge around, around this. And like Zoom fatigue is such a thing. Like I, I don't feel like jumping on more Zoom calls with with new people at the end of the day, because I'm exhausted. So hopefully we're able to leave the house, right? And, and it'll be socially appropriate too. It's, I think it is becoming that way, but it's certainly in the future. But I think that's where like platforms are going to come in, where like um, the, the learning platform that you're part of, you're in a group of like 10 people that you don't know. And then they're saying like, hey, this is your group that you now need to go and solve this problem with. And you go and you go do that. Um, that's how I could imagine the social aspects kind of coming in. That is, of course, better equipped for, for, for older age groups. When it comes to younger, like the ones that like, will not look at a piece of educational content or will play a game, I'm, I'm quite stumped and don't have a good answer to that question. 
happens in other ways, right? Because we, we imagine in this, in a non-COVID situation where you actually can leave the house. So learning is very much online when you have to, but then you can meet people by doing your other things, right? I think it almost moves you away from making your life being structured by education and the formal system of school, university, to, to figuring out other parts of your life extracurricular activities and hobbies which i think will almost compensate for that you feel like you're not getting enough interaction with with what you're learning um and also might be even better because you get to like look at other things that you wouldn't really um have a chance to do if it was like you you had to be in university at these strict hours you had to be at work in these strict hours right um but yeah I, and then speaking about like um little children i know most of your your social cues and and who you are as a person is built in, in like your early childhood development so like if you do move that online um if the whole world is online then i feel like that's okay um but if you do need that social aspect i feel like that's a bit different but also humans are adaptable right so it might just be that we think that this is a huge issue but like natural selection will just end up being that people We'll just be able to to like bridge that gap over online i don't know i also think with that um with being online you miss out a lot of like soft skill things like how to talk how loudly to talk when to talk um you know those very very subtle social nuances are very difficult to teach someone without being in a social setting um so yeah i think that's also going to be quite difficult think that there's a place for sort of traditional teaching I think like we've kind of spoken about this at a university level where like I can learn by myself and that but is there benefit or to having had a structured you know for your eight your have a up to matric of being in a classroom kind of learning how to study learning how to be in a I mean do you think eventually will not have any of that or where is sort of online education most appropriate at what sort of developmental levels this is almost like i don't know if you guys know i think it's called the watershed in cape town like a um i'm not gonna know but it's like a, a shared workspace um so yeah. you kind of book a space in this in the shared workspace when you need it so let's say it's projects then you book that space maybe with a teacher tutor um and that way you're still meeting interacting with people but it's when you have to. About something like that common could be like, it would also like enable you to socialize with people outside of your school. Um, that you wouldn't like, you're not necessarily just going to school with sax, like sax boys, bishops and Herschel all are in the same kind of environment, all interacting with one another. So it could help a lot with the aspect of like mixing and just like meeting people from different backgrounds. I remember someone was saying like they were once doing a meeting and saw someone else drawing on some other whiteboard and kind of got an idea from that you know so if you have mixed people um you also get ideas from very different types of people so maybe someone over yeah. there is doing architecture and then you're like oh but cool maybe we should be a powerful tool is by collective reimagination so the yeah. idea that someone is an active participator in the in the production of knowledge yeah. and so i'm i and the way that I understand that is that that would necessarily, it would necessitate actually being in a room with people and having those conversations and having sort of the, you know, the soft skills that are developed. Um, another article that I read said, you know, trust and innovation comes from, you know, um, face to face interactions. And so I'm just wondering um, how artificial intelligence would displace that specifically would displace that type of model. Mm. I don't think it would. I think I think it depending on. I don't, it depends on on the framework you kind of set up, to so either it stays as this like um, the current model where it's like a teacher giving out information and people listening, or it's that kind of more holistic community driven model of of discovering education. I don't think AI is going to create one or the other. We're going yes. to, and then AI is going to facilitate tools and speed up whatever process in my mind like like the like tech is better suited in a model like that where it's like free flowing and dynamic sure. you could have a better marketplace of ideas and so if, if you're talking about wanting to kind of create this this knowledge and educate like 
content and, and we're like dynamically creating it, you could see what other groups are creating, compare that to yourself, like in real time as you're coming up with different ideas or, or, or propositions. And then you could find and suggest the right content based on where you're kind of going. So it could dynamically generate a path for you as you're, as you're going. That would be the way I, I, see, I see it kind of interacting. I think right. also there's, spa there's space for both things to exist, to coexist, right? So I think in order for it to be a constructive environment of that like collective problem solving knowledge creation, you all need to have a certain base level of like fundamental skills. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't send a rocket to the moon until you've understood calculus or physics or whatever it is, right? So I think where the, the AI and the personalized education journey really comes in is, is teaching you the skills you need to solve a given problem. And I think the best structured curriculum is even now in the, in the old fashioned way of doing things have a blend of these are the basic skills you must understand and you're going to have to learn them the hard way by just doing problems and then applying these things you have learned with teammates to collaborate on solving a bigger, harder, more realistic problem. And I think that can only be better sorted out by involving AI. So yeah, like Camille was saying, I think, I think that, Yes, we do our best work together. And certainly in terms of AI, we're very far from having something that can think and come up with as original ideas as a group of people all together from different backgrounds. Yeah. But I think in terms of teaching people the requisite skills to contribute meaningfully in that kind of space is where AI is really going to find its value at the moment, is by giving people the best shot at learning the skills. Sure, that's really good. Thank you. I wonder if AI could also... Um find more content on a current like discussion that you're having with people um so in so if you're doing a collaborative job everyone's thinking everyone's talking everyone's like oh you know why is the sky blue then it could find a whole bunch of articles and then you could you know it could help you flow more um because it's doing the research while you're doing the thinking yeah um this might sound like a stupid question but like how much does ai cost and what's the how much does ai development cost is it is it as is it accessible um and would like for instance government be able to distribute that kind of technology i i mean i have no idea i don't know if you guys have an idea yeah. i don't i don't think that's a stupid question i think that's like yeah very fair and one i probably don't know the answer to like a hundred percent um it's more ai would be more like a service right so like google facebook these are the companies that are in the best position to be creating that, that kind of, those kinds of tools. And then you would use those tools as a service in a similar way, and it will be kind of add-ons to Google. So when you're Googling something, um, it's already using AI in the background in order to find you the best search results and, and kind of move things between. But that's, that's one way it's gonna move in, and then it's gonna be the companies themselves, right? So um, the, the company that will be creating kind of internal tools um, that can be accelerated doing it. The, the cost of it, like the actual cost, is comes down to two pieces. One is like the infrastructure, so like the computers that has to run the, the algorithm. Um, and two is the data that goes into it. So in order to train um, AI, the big missing piece is, is a lot of data. Um, and and that's, that's the expensive part, is getting like a lot of good data um, that's hard. Look, I, I think also, um, I'm not meaning to insult anyone when I start, but like in terms of like, I think AI is this like uh, fantastical idea. AI is just applied stats, right? It's telling a computer to look at lots and lots and lots and lots of examples and say, okay, this is the trend I'm seeing and I'm going to then fit to that trend. So Google's ads work off of you click on more YouTube videos that have uh, keyboards in them than guitars so then it'll show you someone playing a keyboard learn how to play the keyboard videos right like in its looser sense and that same idea would then be applied to education where um for example this in lockdown i realized i was spending a lot more time on the computer so i wanted to learn how to type fast um so i started teaching myself touch typing and the website i used uses uh, a machine learning algorithm that identifies which letters and combinations of letters you typically type slowest or get wrong and then it feeds those back into what you're doing more frequently. So you practice Adaptive the learning. stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it, it's, it's not really this like 
um, fantastical creature of like a robot that's going to tell you exactly what you need to know. All it does is it makes more efficient the process of finding the stuff you need, right? So you could take, if you had a database of the past like 10 years, 20 years of matric results, I don't know, 10 years, because I changed the system like eight years ago. Um, and you looked at every, and you had like detailed data of where students went wrong and you found the most common mistakes, you could probably restructure the curriculum slightly to teach those mistakes more intensively and the other stuff that everyone gets right less. And there you'd have made an AI improvement to teaching. So it, it, it's not like this fantastical beast. It's really like an, it's an optimizer, if you will. Yeah. So just on the point of data, I know that um, some people or like, you know, on the Twitter streets, on the TL, people have been saying that like, um, like uh you know like self-driving cars and stuff i'm assuming that is that ai or was that a different kind of technology yeah. so no, yeah. that like let's say a self-driving car wouldn't be able to recognize a black child versus being able to recognize a white child mm -hmm. like because of the data it's being fed so i think we also need to think of the biases of the data that we're giving um with these machines um into and how that will um translate in, in the education system so i think like when we look at curriculums already and the idea of like decolonizing curriculums it's like are we just going to feed these uh you know feed in information that's just going to keep in the same sort of societal structures and like is there even data available and i guess it has to be a lot a lot of data and a lot of good quality data um is there enough available from a multitude of views and a multitude of people um in order to make sure we're creating as holistic as possible um, the, these systems or these education systems. Yeah, I think that's, that is, that's a huge problem. And one that like these companies are, are certainly realizing because what they're realizing is like, like recruitment. So it's, it's used a lot in recruitment is one example, right? Because you have million, like thousands of applicants, you need some way for HR to then sort through these applicants and be like, this is the best person, this is not. So they put in that, through AI and the current system is going to look at the data of what currently works and what currently works would be like white guys, whatever it might be. So it's not going to then look at what's, it's, it's going to optimize based on what's currently been working and not yeah. what's actually right. So yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. And this is also one of the jobs that AI isn't going to take is, is fitting things to like the softer stuff, like that works for people. So culturally, for example. So um, one of the biggest criticisms of the way that physical science is taught in high school um, in, an, in an African context is that some of the technical terms do not exist in all African languages. So when they show mm. up on an exam, are you supposed to know what that is? Like nobody can blame you if the word does not exist in your language, right? So there's the AI part and there's also the human part where we actually need people who have studied further from those cultures to be willing to work on the content to then feed back into younger people emerging from those cultures because there's I no guess. way for for me as a non whatever language or culture person to explain this idea back to someone who has like a completely different context than you right and that's one of the big like decolonization ideas that's come to the forefront at least in my mind yeah. trained teachers of color who can speak um, their language and we get those people to develop the curriculum and then we feed that data into these systems. I feel like it almost feels like we're so far away as a country to get to somewhere where, you know, this would be all great and well um, when we have such like fundamental issues in our education system. And I don't know, like for me, whenever I think of South Africa, I'm like, it's like, two worlds there's people who literally don't have access to water and electricity yeah. and the other people who are like okay how can i get my internet speed higher you know what i mean like and we're so divided and it's like how do you first you have to bring everyone together and then move forward and it's like but how long do you wait to bring everyone together that you don't lose track of what's happening elsewhere i feel like this is a broad question but like it's always something i think about and i think the problem is also that the people who don't have access might be the majority of the country but it's that's not where the money's located and because money drives things and drives innovation and it frees up time for people to do a whole lot of other things and you know develop and that kind of stuff it's like those people keep like the rich keep getting richer vibes and they get more resources and that and then 
he sort of makes solutions for the poor, but it's like a lot of these solutions are so far ahead of where they are. I think people don't really care if they don't have a laptop if they can't, you know, turn on the lights kind of thing. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I wanna I wanna propose an idea. Um so there's this awesome new company in South Africa um who are putting solar panels into schools to reduce school electricity bills and provide solar power. Um and the way they're funding it, so the schools don't have to pay, is that they're selling the solar panels um, by solar cell as an investment and then providing returns on your investments. So you buy however many solar cells as if you're buying shares and then you get some, it's like 11% per annum and they've got a really good return at the moment. Um, and you can, huh. yeah, I'll send you the link to me if you're interested. Um, but um, they've signed a bunch of big contracts already, like the whole of Rondo Bosch Boys, every roof is getting covered in solar panels. Um, they've Norman Henshelwood, there are a couple of the Cape Town schools, but um, why don't you do the same thing with learning, right? Where, like you mentioned with Lambda, you can take the, a percentage of people's future salaries, like how, how diverse, or how much do you need to diversify your risk for an 800 Rand Raspberry Pi and projector set up in a classroom if you've got 30 students or 40 students in that class that are all probably, thanks to your education, gonna do much better in their lives. And if you then, even you can, you can limit it to, um, only those that make it to university and get university educations will have to give a percentage of their salary because then obviously we're expecting them to make a bit more money. And you can make it a small percentage because you're diversifying that risk a lot. Um, yeah. and, and that kind of model suddenly has a lot of appeal in a South African context because you get the money from people who have it and promise them some incentive of their own, but you change lives with that money, right? Like it, yeah. it really enables you to do stuff that there isn't budget to do here, which I quite like the idea of. No, that's, that's, that's cool thinking. I dig it. Um, I really want, I want to read about that, that solar panel um, thing. That sounds, that 